Uh, well, hi everyone, I'm Nick. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I'm from uh, Seattle, Washington. That's where I'm right now. Um, and I'm part of, uh, I'm a postdoc at the University of Washington um, at the Tasker Center for Accessible Technology. Uh, and I'm the co-founder of the Open Sidewalks and Access Map projects. Uh, and so I continue working on those and we do a lot of cool things at the Tasker Center. Um, cool. Okay. So today uh, I'm going to talk about the Open Sidewalks project, um, kind of what it is, what how it can have impact or tie into other things, including, of course, OpenStreetMap, um, and then some of kind of our current initiatives. Uh, and I'm going to try to go real fast through my slides so there can be plenty of time for talking. I guess I already did my introductions. Boop. So if we're going to talk about the, the project. So this quote kind of captures a lot of our inspiration for our projects. Um, I'll just read it. This is a, a quote from a, uh, someone that we talked to early on in the project. Using a tool like directions on Google Maps doesn't really help me get around. Actually, sometimes this does more harm than good. I'm sent down streets I can't cross or up inclines that are impossible to climb. It can be deeply frustrating. Um, this was a manual wheelchair user um, sharing their, their story and letting us use this quote. This is a, this is a fairly typical um, uh, scenario or experience for someone using a manual wheelchair or really a lot of pedestrians uh, with many different concerns. And so one question is, you know, there's a, there's a problem that we have, which is that travelers need usable information that they can trust about the pathways that they're going to try to, to make use of. Um, the person in the previous quote needed to navigate the pedestrian environments. These are public spaces, um, but they didn't have the information they needed in order to know where they actually can and cannot traverse that space. Um, and this raises questions both of, you know, what is the information that they need? And also, how have we designed our spaces? Where are spaces not accessible? We can answer both of these questions through just having more information. As an example of if you are a pedestrian and you, you want to get any kind of directions to try to go somewhere or use a map, current pedestrian trip planning, um, this, is, this is us picking on Google a little bit. If you ask Google for a route, it will give you even several options as a pedestrian. It has a dedicated pedestrian mode. But when you ask for a route, in this case from our light rail station near the university over to the uh, electrical engineering building, which also is connected to computer science, it'll give you three routes. One puts you up a gravel road, and the other two have you take stairs. And so Google has created a, a one-size-fits-all model for how pedestrians behave and act. Um, and as a result, it often gives fairly inaccessible routes. And there, there's no way to input information that says, I personally cannot handle a gravel road, for example. Um, similarly, uh, we can see in downtown Seattle, this is also a problem. There's, also, there's other information that matters a lot. We, we have three routes here again. All three of them suffer from having very steep hills. If you've ever been in downtown Seattle, going in this direction towards kind of the upper right here is very steep going uphill. Um, a lot of people who use manual wheelchairs will not be willing to use that, as well as a lot of other pedestrians are not willing to go up that steep of a hill. Uh, and the question is why Why is is it like that? Why, why do we not have the right information to provide to pedestrians? Um, the answer is usually we don't collect that data, and we don't know how to interpret that kind of data, even if we collected it. So a question is, additionally, what, what are all of the, the stakeholders involved in data about pedestrian spaces? Um, one is, you know, we, we, there are many different people we could we could characterize as, as having a relevant stakeholder kind of relationship with, with this kind of information. One, of course, is commuters. How do I find safe, accessible routes tailored to my abilities? Um, another is is like kind of agency compliance auditing um, that whole space, which would be you know how, how accessible how do accessible paths to my business or transit stops or whatever I'm required to create and make accessible do, do they exist? Um, and then city planners are constantly fighting against figuring out how do they how do they prioritize investments? How can they use information um, and community outreach and, and um, really just information about pedestrian spaces in order to say, where should I put the next sidewalk if I have a budget for it? Usually the budget is limited, so you have to pick the best place to add new infrastructure. And finally, we need to ask a kind of basic question of what information do people want? And so as, as part of developing our project, 
uh, we started by just talking to people. Uh, so we would talk to people of all different stripes, people have all different kinds of assistive devices, different preferences when getting around. Um, and this little cartoon over here is fairly typical of when we talk to people. This might both be manual wheelchair users here, um, but they still have disagreements about what, what they prefer when they traverse the environment. So, so a lot of times when, when people do think about adding or accounting for pedestrian diversity, there's an additional problem of stereotyping. So there will be, um, there will be projects that say we want to make uh, a designation that this is a wheelchair accessible space, or this is preferable for wheelchair users. But in reality, when we go and talk to wheelchair users, they don't all agree on the same things. And a route that one person prefers who uses a manual wheelchair, even the exact same chair, could be very different from the preferences of someone else. Maybe both of these people strongly prefer to climb steep hills. We've talked to people like that. Whereas some, and whereas some person might say, even though I'm willing to go up steep hills, uh, you know, I need curb ramps to get around. I can't handle vertical displacements very well. Whereas someone else, we've talked to several people like this who use manual wheelchairs who say, I will attempt to jump any curb. I will get out of my wheelchair, throw my wheelchair across the curb, crawl over onto, up over the curb, then get back to my wheelchair to save five minutes of time. And so as a result, what we try to do is follow a participatory design approach. And really what, what we mean by this is we, we talk to people constantly and get their feedback and we design for diversity here. So we're, we're trying to learn what captures people's mobility as opposed to stating in advance what it's going to be. So I'm just gonna quickly introduce like what, what two things we're gonna talk about really quickly. We're gonna talk about two projects. One's Open Sidewalks and the other is Access Map. Uh, open Sidewalks is focused on the data. So we need to be able to map our pedestrian spaces and Open Sidewalks has, a, has an opinion on this, which is that they need to be mapped as networked elements that can have their own properties. Through that strategy, we can say that pedestrian diversity can be accounted for as an interpretation of the network and its properties. So rather than saying a path is, is wheelchair accessible, we can say, here is this path with all of these attributes to it. Here is an example of how one wheelchair user might need to traverse the environment. Now we can say if it's accessible for them. Um, so, and in addition to kind of defining what data we need to collect, we actually also go and help collect that data in OpenStreetMap. Access Map is about uh, kind of demonstrating the utility of providing this information directly to users. It is similar in interface to something like Google Maps or Bing Maps, uh, where you can ask for directions, explore a map. Uh, but importantly, you can get very specific uh, tailored information for your personal needs. So for example, this is just a screenshot showing Access Map. Uh, which is currently focused on uh, released for, I guess I should say, three three areas in Washington. Uh, so there's Seattle, Washington, uh, Mount Vernon, uh, thanks to the efforts of Clifford, um, and Bellingham, all of which we currently support with with many more very soon on the way. And what what should hopefully pop out about this is that we have emphasized some of the primary pedestrian network in downtown Seattle. These major colored elements here are all sidewalks. The, the blocked out lines here are crossings. The crossings have visual indicators, which like, consist, consistently downtown, there's curb ramps everywhere. But if there was not a curb ramp on one side, it would show as a dotted red line indicating inaccessibility. And you can see that, for example, these, these steep hills downtown are dotted red lines, meaning difficult, like technically impossible for this person to, to use according to their own preferences, um, which leads us to, again, diversity and pedestrian experience. And, and allowing people to dial in their own preferences and interpret the network um, through their preferences, which is over here. So even just was, even just these three dials right here is a vast improvement over the typical status quo for how you can, you can get and retrieve information about pathways, um, given that you have some kind of mobility requirement. So as you can feel free to test that accessmap.io, as you drag around these settings, the map itself will change and it will describe whether it's accessible to you or not, and it will generate new routes based on the preferences that you set up. Similarly, we can take, we can take this, this kind of network interpretation and use it not just for information retrieval for individuals, but we can use it, use it to ask questions about the built environment itself. So down the bottom right here, um, I'll say if we, if we take this kind of data, open sidewalks data, um, most of it coming from OpenStreetMap, and we combine it with this, what we call profiles and access map, which would be 
the settings that a given person needs to, to describe themselves, we can actually ask questions of the infrastructure, right? We can say, this is what it's like to traverse this space and actually make it a question of, of the space itself. Instead of just saying, here's how to get around an accessibility problem, we can say, here are accessibility problems. So as an example, in the upper left here, we may ask the question, how many schools can I reach in 10 minutes? And in this case, on the upper left, I'm using a normative walking profile. Um, and what we're displaying here is a, a map that shows in color uh, where there is at least one uh, school that can be reached within 10 minutes from that part of the network. In addition, we've colored it darker where you can reach, where someone could reach more. Um, more schools. So you can see, first of all, there are a large number of spaces where you need to walk more than 10 minutes to get to a school in Seattle. Um, we can also see that by comparing to a, a manual wheelchair profile on the right, that at least the extent of area covered is quite a bit smaller and that the denser areas are also smaller, right? This is kind of what we would expect given that manual wheelchair profile is more constrained, but it's valuable to be able to ask this question of the infrastructure itself and to uh, iterate on this kind of question. Um, similarly, we've recently published a paper describing this. The, the idea is if we wanted to, to get some idea of walkability, we could generate walk sheds for every single element of the network and say, here's the space that you can get to within, again, maybe like 10 minutes of, of pedestrian motility, right? And so uh, each one of those, those extents represents a space you could reach. We normalize that by the space you could reach with the street network so that it, it's uh, being fair to whether we should expect sidewalks or not. And then we, we produce that number where a score of zero would mean there's straight up just no sidewalks here. A score of one would mean you can get to just as many places with the sidewalk network as you could if you were using the street network. And anything in between says that there is a deficiency compared to the street network. And this, this roughly follows you know, like a sidewalk density map, but it's not the same as it. It actually produces distinct results because it knows about the connectivity of sidewalks to each other, as well as across the street. Um, and similarly, we can say the same question. Again, manual wheelchairs going to be more constrained. Scores are generally lower. And we can see it has kind of a unique shape to it. It, it's, it doesn't just map to the, the density of curve ramps or anything like that. And importantly, we can start asking equity questions as well. Um, because we can ask the same type of question uh, across different profiles, we can compare the results for a given uh, profile versus maybe, in this case, a normative profile. We, we named it sidewalk reach quotient, quotient, but the important thing is just to know <laughs> that that this is, this is saying, I compare how accessible the space is under this profile versus this profile for every element of the entire street network. And we can see places where they're more equitable, which would be closer to a value of one, this yellow here where downtown-ish is, the, I guess the part of downtown that's flat <laughs> is equitable. Once you get to the steep area, no longer so equitable. It's harder to get around if you if you are following our very stereotyped, in this case, again, manual wheelchair profile, although we have a few of them. Um, and we can also compare you know, with the powered, powered wheelchair one, see what are, what are the different experiences going on here. And we can use this to highlight where there are inequities, where we might need to focus investment um, and just understand the network better. Cool. Okay, so we're talking in MapYR. We're talking in OpenStreetMap. Why are we talking about that? Well, Open Sidewalks is uh, integrated with, it's part of, it promotes OpenStreetMap and it uses OpenStreetMap. It's an OpenStreetMap kind of project. Uh, but first, we're going to need even more motivation. Sorry about that. We need a little more context. So, so again, like what, what kind of data do we need for routing, for answering these kinds of questions that I just presented? Um, and the answer is we need to know where pedestrian paths are. And we need to know how they connect. We need, whenever possible, quote unquote, neutral attributes of that space. Maybe what type of surface is it? How wide is the path? Are there barriers along the path that change how wide the usable part of the path is? If I was to walk along or just otherwise move along uh, the sidewalk and use the crossing, would I encounter a raised curb or not? This is all information that we want to be able to that we need to be able to collect in order to account for that pedestrian diversity um, that I keep mentioning, where it, it wouldn't make sense to say this is wheelchair accessible or it's not wheelchair accessible because for some people some wheelchair users it might be and others it might not be. It really depends on the actual attributes of all these physical features. And so the question 
you know, becomes if we want to do this, where can we get data? Um, and this is going to be a you know a United States centric option, but it's similar in many different places, where investments for data have typically been made heavily for automobile roadmaps, but not for sidewalks or pedestrian paths. Uh, like the Tiger data set, we know it has problems, of course, as OpenStreetMap users, but you can see it covers at least the whole US and it gets updated by an agency, right? That doesn't happen for pedestrian data. Um, some cities or agencies, usually at a more local level, have data that is about sidewalks or other pedestrian features, but it's in totally non-standard formats. They've all done it in a different way, usually. And this, these are kind of some examples down below. In Seattle, the, this is how we kind of got, I got started out with Access Map, so it was very helpful. But the, what it publishes is center lines of sidewalks. These are not actually known locations. These are extrapolated from the streets, and they do a bad job extrapolating. So they crisscross incorrectly all over the place. We had to fix that to make Access Map work. It was a lot of work. We don't want to, have to do that every single time uh, necessarily. It would not be scalable um, or, or sustainable as a project to rely on custom fixing of every single data set. Uh, similarly, Portland, very commonly, there will be um, polygons published for pedestrian layers, including different amounts of stuff between different cities. Um, this comes from ortho imagery, usually, that's been analyzed maybe with some additional sensors. Or San Francisco, they publish some curbs, not much else, and the curb lines are not right. And so the the standard, the, the, the situation is that we, we can't really rely entirely on, on agencies or city data, should be the biggest takeaway. Um, but we, what we do want to do is use a data commons, which in this case would be OpenStreetMap. So all these different groups do have an interest. Like agencies are supposed to be aware of these things. The public cares a lot, of course, about pedestrian spaces. Private organizations also have an interest in, in knowing about um, about sidewalks. Like I've gotten strange emails from like venture capitalist people asking about sidewalks so that they can invest in like scooters. Uh, I'm not sure how useful that is, but <laughs> but uh, they've. Uh, contacted me, um, and of course, research, asking questions about our spaces. OpenStreetMap offers a way, potentially, for all these different groups to at least communicate with one another to some extent and to say, hey, I think this fact is like this on the ground. And that's how we want to use it and how we do try to use it within the Open Sidewalks project. Uh, you all already know most of these things, if not all of these things, about OpenStreetMap. Um, the one I would focus on the most is, of course, we want to keep all of our data open. This is data in the public interest, and the public has, you know, the public should have access to this information and be able to contribute to it. Um, and there's also an advantage to the single layer of data model that OpenStreetMap uses. Um, it, it promotes the making of connections between our infrastructure data, and that's super important with pedestrian data, where it's less structured than, than streets, right? Streets have all these rules and compliance levels, and they're relatively simple to represent as a line. Um, pedestrian layers are a lot more complicated, so it's really good to be able to make connections between our data, and as well as to be able to fall back on the street network wherever we need to. Um, this is an incomplete example of kind of some of the spaces that have been mapped according to kind of the open sidewalks strategy for, for describing data. These are like data sets that we publish. Um, Bellingham and Seattle are massaged municipal data sets that we are expanding into OpenStreetMap. Open Mount Vernon was mapped like primarily by Clifford, who's here today, did a really great job mapping out Mount Vernon. Um, and then San Jose was mapped by some also uh, OpenStreetMap, very, very active people um, in the OpenStreetMap community down in San Jose. They mapped out a huge number of sidewalks and, and crossings there. Um, and there's a lot more projects. I'm going to make sure to mention them um, towards the end as well as kind of our call to action. People who are here today working on really great stuff in their own cities, mapping out uh, sidewalk data that is like, compatible with what we, what we call open sidewalks. Um, <clears throat> there is one problem to using OpenStreetMap for our, our project though, which is OpenStreetMap is you know, often described as kind of just a database, right? We OpenStreetMap leaves a lot of things up to downstream um, interpretation, downstream tooling. And so discoverability is quite quite a pain, right? If you go to OpenStreetMap.org and you're like, I want to map sidewalks, you have no idea what to do when you first get there. You need to go find other resources and put in the time to understand which ones are right, which ones are applicable to your local area, and learn kind of some like basic GIS stuff even sometimes. So there's a bit of a, a learning curve. It's not obvious. It, it doesn't try to compete with Google Maps, and so there isn't an integrated like use case or application that someone wants to use where they might come across something that they want to fix in the data. 
um, which is something we think is important for, for engagement here and getting good data. Um, and probably my biggest pet peeve, not my pet peeve, biggest challenge when it comes to mapping out pedestrian data is that it's usually almost entirely missing. Um, but one challenge is it's not obvious where more data is needed because I can't tell the difference by default in OpenStreetMap from a space where nobody has tried to map sidewalks from a space where there are not sidewalks. Um, so that, that's a challenge that we're going to uh, show our, our attempt to tackle it. Uh, just a second. Oh, that's right here. Okay, great. So this is a, the coordination tool. So the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team publishes this tasking manager that I'm sure a lot of, maybe even all of you have seen and used before. Um, and it's really great for doling out units of work for mapping out um, you know, tasks that may need to be done in OpenStreetMap. Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team does it, of course, for humanitarian purposes. Um, I want to use it, and I do use it, to help tackle that problem of how do you know a space lacks sidewalks versus needs uh, versus uh, it hasn't been mapped yet. So from this, we can start collecting a database essentially of, of audits and when people have last, last edited information. Um, and of course, also can help coordinate mapping parties so that people can jump in and start adding information. Cool. Um, now we can talk about the actual kind of collection part. What does it, what does it look like? Um, fundamentally, it should look a lot like things you are already doing in OpenStreetMap or, or are going to soon be doing in OpenStreetMap. Um, and the first thing I should say is our project is really heavily focused on first building what we consider to be the basic urban pedestrian network. This is an American-centric description of the basic pedestrian network. Um, but the idea is if we were to map out some of the missing elements of the pedestrian network in OpenStreetMap, we would need to know where are sidewalks, where can you cross the street, and how do you link sidewalks to street crossings, which is something I'm going to describe a bit in a second. Um, we consider this to be kind of like the most basic thing you need in order to add even more data that's very relevant to people. So if we wanted to say, oh, also at curb ramps as well. Um, but if we wanted to say, you know, how wide is the sidewalk? Well, first we definitely need to map the sidewalk before we can say how wide it is. So for example, we take we take street crossings and we we part, part of what we do is we help we try to define ways to use tags that exist in OpenStreetMap. So the crossing tag to, to draw a line as a street crossing exists, but exactly how are you supposed to connect it to everything else? A lot of people do it in different ways from one another. Um, and so we we advocate for certain strategies by which to, to do this mapping. So we say street crossings, we recommend that you only draw them on the road surface itself. A crossing starts and ends at the curb, essentially. Um, and street crossings, we only care if it's marked or unmarked. There's uh, all kinds of tagging stuff I guess we could talk about, but this is this is what we care about and think would be a good primary tag uh, for a crossing. Um, in addition, we, we might need more than one to represent alternative paths. Uh, it all kind of depends on the strategy by which we understand OpenStreetMap. But you can see in this corner here, there are several alternative paths to get onto this crossing. You could get onto this, this crossing here, starting from this sidewalk, uh, starting from the, the, the right side, and then going straight up. You could enter that this crossing by use by uh, going off using this curb ramp here. You could also enter this crossing by using the crossing on the left here, skipping the sidewalk entirely, and just going over to to this path over here. Those are all paths that real people take, and we should be able to represent them because each one of them actually has a unique accessibility concern to it as well. Um, two of those paths used a curb ramp; one did not, um, and one of them avoided entirely needing to get onto a sidewalk, which is also valuable to know. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's get that part. Okay, cool. Uh, sidewalks, we kind of try to do a similar kind of rule. We say, hey, a sidewalk, what is a sidewalk? We say it's the center line. People are usually trying to draw a center line primarily. They say that thing is the sidewalk, right? We're saying that it's the path on the side of a street. We're going to describe it as a center line, just how we describe a street with a center line of the street. Uh, this brings up the challenge of, well, how do you connect them? If you were to draw according to our two rules, uh, crossings would not be connected to the streets. There would be gaps where all these highlighted places are. We uh, we kind of internally call those links. These are pathways that connect those two pieces of infrastructure. I typically map these as plain footways. Uh, I think we should work on promoting a new tagging strategy for describing this awkward situation where this is a pathway that's on a sidewalk, but it's not the sidewalk in a way, right? Um, but in the meantime, we recommend just connecting them with the plain footway. 
Uh, and of course, curb information. That's a, this is of primary importance, especially in the US where curbs are very, very frequently raised um, and present uh, an accessibility barrier for a lot of people. Um, and so we map this just like OpenTreeMap says to do as, as a node at the actual curb interface. Um, and one important feature of this is that they exist at the end of the crossings where they meet this link that we described. So it's kind of a nice feature for QA and understanding the space is where we, we know where we can expect to see a curb, whether it's raised, lowered, or flush, any kind of curb um, information. Cool. So I want to be also just review really quickly uh, the kind of open sidewalk contribution. So I want to emphasize, of course, we're building on top of OpenTreatMap for describing this stuff. Pretty much, I think everything I showed you is already a pre-existing OSM tag, right? So we didn't invest the tags, invent the tags, but what we do is we promote a few different things. We promote sidewalks as entities. So you may have seen people uh, mapping sidewalks as a piece, like a tag that you add to a street. We advocate for mapping them separately as their own entities so that we can add properties to them and route on them and, and make explicit connections to them with the rest of the infrastructure, which is something that is really awkward and painful, um, sometimes impossible with the uh, other, other schema. Um, we also try to define, justify, and promote how to connect elements, which I kind of covered just now. Uh, tag proposals. Uh, this might be my my mapping New Year resolution. Is uh, I've developed some proposals and haven't pushed a lot of them through. So I'm going to try to promote them and work with the community a bit, get some feedback, try to get some tags in there. Um, but there have been some other spearheaded efforts that we've we've helped with that have gotten some cool tag tag proposals through. Um, and something we focus on a lot is tools and organizing of data collection. Um, and this, is, of course, isn't just us. Um, this is a big lift from the communities, people who are in OpenStreetMap doing the actual mapping, uh, as well as our partners who, who kind of help get us and connected with people, help host mapping parties, um, and so on. Cool. Um, so now I'm quickly going to talk about our team challenge, which is just going to be showing showing a tasking manager. Um, I think if I go up here, you can still see my screen. So we host our own tasking manager. Um, and here we have quite a few projects now. Um, uh, Columbus, Ohio group actually was our was the very first group to really get interested in this. And we, we built the tasking manager early, and they were super gung-ho about it um, and have been mapping out a ton of crossings and sidewalks here. Um, you can see, for example, uh, if we zoom in on this, this neighborhood um, in Columbus, that all the crossings are essentially mapped out for this neighborhood now. Um, and that they're working on finishing up the sidewalks. Uh, we also have a, a Teams, like we have a much larger project of collecting this data in a lot of different cities. Uh, I should also mention Charlottesville. Charl Charlottesville is also an early adopter, doing great mapping work there. Um, and we also have five or more cities that we've also added uh, in South America, as well as other parts of the United States. We're mapping out more areas of Quito, Ecuador, uh, Valparaiso, and Santiago, Chile. Uh, we've got uh, uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil and uh, uh, Los Angeles, that's places that we're focused on. Um, and we're doing right now a, a team challenge, which is to say we're putting out a challenge to map out more of these cities. Or if you want to get your own project started um, on this Tasking Manager and go really gung-ho and map out a lot of information and open street map about uh, pedestrian spaces, we'll, we'll make a project for you. Um, we're doing a challenge to see who can, who can map the most <laughs> in, in the upcoming like month or so. Um, and so if you're interested in that, please feel free to go to test.opensidewalks.com or to email me with my contact information that, that will be at the end of the presentation over here or just get in contact. Um, would love to talk to more people, get more people involved, get feedback. Um, and one thing I want to also show off if possible, let me see, I might need to share a different screen. Yeah, I do. Okay, I'm gonna share a different screen. This one is going to be Oh, you get to see a terminal. How oh, fun. OK. Oh, I close it. Good. OK, so this is showing uh, uh, a version of Access Map that we use um, in collaboration with, that, that works with our tasking manager. And so this is pulling exclusively from OpenStreetMap to generate an Access Map. Um, <clears throat> and what I want to emphasize is that this is meant to, uh, first of all, of course, it does actually draw from OpenStreetMap so we can you know, take our Take our tool, ask for a route. It will give us a route that works for this person. Um, there may be more interesting routes that we could uh, ask for. Assuming uh, my prototype isn't broken, let's see. Oh, oh, it's being slow. There we go. 
Uh, so we get like realistic routes that someone would actually want given these settings. Um, but what I want to emphasize is we, we're also using it as a way to potentially try to drive engagement with our city's challenges, where we can say, turn on the tasks. Um, and it shows, once it, once it loads, <laughs> I think the screen sharing is making it slow. Um, it shows the areas where, where the tasks relevant to the city have been mapped or not. Uh, and so let's see, let me see if I understand the uh, coloring scheme here. You can see we have kind of overlapping task, task areas. Areas that are completely uh, or, or close to see-through are areas that have been mapped both for sidewalks and crossings. And areas that have at least one dark color have not been mapped for one or the other. So this is kind of a way to, to see in almost real time, once a day it updates, to see um, your contributions pop up and see how which areas get, get mapped out. Um, and it also offers kind of a cool, interesting project for us of, of explicitly knowing like, you know, where, where is there known information about, about pathways, where is there not, and how should we route people or understand that situation? If you go across this barrier where we don't know anything about that, that area, should we present you a different route? Cool. All right, I'll share my other screen so I can show my contact info. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so my contact info is over here. You can contact me here, boltnetc.washington.edu, or my advisor here, or just opensidewalks.gmail.com, if that's easier to remember. That will also go to both of us. Um, I'll open up for questions and feedback.